we're launching our first ever seminar event, the Fine Home Building Summit. Join us October 2nd through the 4th in Southbridge, Massachusetts, as 12 of the building industry's most notable experts will offer more than 50 hours of presentations. Our goal? To explore advanced design principles, discover cutting edge construction materials, and share trusted techniques. Space for this event is limited and expected to sell out fast. Don't wait. Visit finehomebuilding.com slash summit to pre-register. That's finehomebuilding.com slash summit. Because like my dad has got this property in upstate New York, which is about a four-hour drive from us. And he's like, oh, there's tons of this great field stone up here. If you want to bring it to your walls, like... How yeah, the right. heck are we <laughs> on your little Harbor Freight trailer? Are we going to drag gonna that stuff here. for four hours on the throughway? <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Deputy Editor Matt Milham. Hey. Rob Wadsack, Digital Brand Manager. Howdy. And Producer Jeff Rose. Hello. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Thanks for being with me, guys. Yeah. Sure. Uh, let's get into some listener feedback. The first letter is from Dave in Charlottesville, and he wrote about your uh, rain barrels. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, I'm no expert. We've got three rain barrels behind our carport. Uh, here's a tip for Matt so he gets better volume from his setup. Use a quarter-turn ball valve spigot like the Rain Pow RB005 brass water container slash rain barrel quarter-turn spigot. They cost about 15 bucks, and he found them on Amazon. Um, what do you think about these? They have a couple of features that you had to use multiple fittings, yeah, right? Yeah, I had to cobble together. Yeah, it's got like an integral bulkhead fitting right so on the thing. So tell and us what the bulkhead brass. fitting is. It's it's meant to seal the valve to the barrel itself, right? Yeah, yeah. I, another name for them, I think, is just barrel adapters. And it's like a flange with a rubber washer on it, and yeah. you put it through a hole, and then you tighten it on, on the backside, and that makes a seal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So does that work with any valve, or is it a special valve? It's a special valve. Okay. Yeah. His his is. Yeah. His um, is. Yeah. The one I did, I cobbled together from various pieces. <laughs> I'd never heard of a bulkhead fitting, but yeah. it makes sense. It's like to adapt a tank to some other mm -hmm. drain whatever. Yeah. And yeah. this one would have been a much better option for me if I knew this existed. <laughs> like, I didn't know what I was looking for, so... So those of you out there who are considering a rain barrel setup, uh, you're going to want to look for the Rain Pal RBS005 Brass Water Container Rain Barrel Quarter Turn Spigot on Amazon. And mm -hmm. I will put a link on the podcast page so you all can find that if you want to build some rain barrels. Now, Matt, have you gotten any use out of this system yet? Are you actually yeah. using it regularly? Yeah. And, and how many gallons do you have total? Uh, 90, roughly. 90. And yeah. And are you going through it quickly? Or? Yeah. Yeah. It's surprising how fast you go through 90 gallons. What are you watering? Uh, right now with it, the lawn, because mm -hmm. it's so dry. Yep. But, uh, yeah, I it was probably about half full last night, and I opened it up, and I moved the sprinkler around a bunch, because it does <laughs> sort of run a very small sprinkler. Yep. And, uh, yeah, went through the rest of it, so probably dumped 40 gallons last night uh, in anticipation of rain today. And do you know, like, how much rainfall it takes to fill them? Have you figured that out? I haven't yet. Um, I think it was last week it rained really hard. and by We the had time, about an inch of rain. Yeah, and by the time I got home, they were full. And cool. it had probably been raining 15 minutes at that point, so it's hard to say. Yeah, that's, you know, my, my wife, Michelle, used to be an editor at Fine Gardening, and so she, you know, she spent a lot of time thinking about rain barrels. And, you know, so many people... You, even at, when I worked at Green Building Advisor, I would, would always make a note, oh, green features, and they'd always list rain barrels on there. And the thing is, you know, most of the rain barrels you can buy pre-made are, what, 50 gallons or, you know, maybe there's some bigger ones than that. But the thing is, if you don't get a l frequent rain, you, they will basically only be useful for short periods of time. Because yeah. if, you're, if, you have a, if you're a serious gardener or if you have a lawn or something like that, you're, gonna, you're not going to get enough rain to make it, like, it's not going to get you through a drought. Yeah, 50 gallons is not that much when no. you open up that <laughs> tap. That's why I can I, run our well dry, irrigating our garden in about 45 minutes. Like, it'll just completely man. be gone. Yeah, you need a deeper well. 
it's already 400 feet. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but so, you know, people who think about if they're really interested in co- rainwater collection, you really have to start thinking about going to bigger size containers mm-hmm. or multiple containers because when you think about it in Texas or in parts of Australia. Can you guys where, imagine what it yeah. c- like takes to irrigate a golf course in Las Vegas, for example, like how many thousands of gallons of water every day. Yeah. Yeah. Or ha- or, or to top off the uh, fountains at the Bellagio every day when it's 100 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> That's why Lake Mead has been going down, down, down. They're like drilling a new tunnel because the the level of the lake has gone down so far. It's really it's disturbing when you, when you fly over there going into Vegas, you can actually see like the salt where rings. the docks used to be, <laughs> yeah. right? And the salt rings. And yeah. it's really... Uh, obvious like how much water is not filling the, t- in the yeah. lake yeah. but but basically just if you're if you're considering rainwater collection just got to do some math and be realistic you know honest with yourself about what the use is i mean if, if it's a remote location or a vegetable garden and you've got a big shed or a barn and you just need some remote you know occasional irrigation then maybe s- a small container might do it do it for you but yeah. uh, but otherwise if you're just watering some potted plants outside yeah uh, so at, at the risk of making Matt sick of hearing about masonry buildings, uh, we heard about <laughs> masonry construction again. Uh, this comes from Douglas Battersby, who's a uh, residential architect in Oakland, New Jersey. Hey, guys, the last couple of podcasts, you talked about insulating brick homes and how to deal with the floor joists when they're pocketed into the masonry. In modern construction, foundations shouldn't be backfilled until the floor system is installed. Otherwise, the masonry isn't just a foundation wall. It's also a retaining wall. What he's saying is that the floor system helps resist soil pressure that's on the foundation wall. And if you try and backfill a block wall, especially without the floor system being in place, you risk pushing it over from the soil pressure. Right especially if you get a downpour and ask me how I know this. Uh, I would assume, which I really shouldn't, that in most cases, oh, here we go. Uh, I'm not saying that the wall will inevitably cave in if the joists are cut from the pockets, but it is something to evaluate before you start any work. So what he's saying is if you have this masonry building and you separate the floor system from the masonry, there's a potential that that floor or the building is no longer going to be able to resist the soil pressure. And... uh, I'm sure that's very case specific because if the masonry is all above ground, it should be fine. But if you have a sloping lot and a, a lot of it is, or some of it is uh, a below grade, yeah, I think that's a real concern. Yeah, sure. And it, I mean, it depends on how high your water table is and what type of soils you have against it. To and uh, how big the building is, and, and you may not be able to figure out what all those variables are. But it's kind of the same rule you apply to any kind of demolition work. As, is you don't always know if something is structural, and maybe it wasn't even intended to be structural, right. but over the years it became that way as <laughs> right. things settled. So it's like it's kind of like when you're getting ready to knock out a stud wall in a house, kind of tap the tap one of the studs and see it, how tight if, it is. If the, yeah. <laughs> if the cut is closing flat. on your saw blade, you know that it's uh, probably risky to remove it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, interestingly, this hasn't come up in any of the prior conversations with regard to uh, insulating masonry buildings, so I thought we should read it. Um, He would assume, I would assume, he says, I would assume, which I really shouldn't, that in most cases you'll be all right cutting the joists, but there are some cases such as uh, a straight and long foundation wall that is receiving a lot of soil pressure that you may run into issues. Another factor that can add strength would be if there are any first floor walls that are perpendicular and intersect the outside wall. So he's saying that they're going to be taking up some of the load if there are walls that abut into this masonry. Um, These perpendicular walls would, could help keep the outside wall plumb, and that outside wall is connected to the sill plate, which is sitting on the foundation slash retaining wall. An engineer wouldn't assume any structural integrity is added by these first floor walls or floor sheathing running over the sill plate, but it's just part of the structural redundancy of wood construction that allows some mistakes to be made. If I were doing this in my own house, I would securely fasten the new stud wall that supports the newly cut joist to the basement slab and joists above and then provide some blocking that is tight to the stud slash foundation wall or maybe a steel bracket just for peace of mind. I would do the same thing on the second floor joists as well. So he's saying he's going to reinforce uh, perpendicular walls to help uh, take up some of that soil pressure that you are now relying on the masonry to resist exclusively without the help of the floor system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder how many homeowners, remodeling contractors out there are really paying attention to, you know, when they're, when they're doing major gut rehabs or whatever, 
they where the loads are in a house because like I was in a small bungalow, actually a relative's house that had been gutted to the rafters, a tiny little house. So like it was, there wasn't much to it. It probably gutted the whole thing in in a um, in a weekend or two. But the ceiling joists in this 1920s little tiny house used to run from wall from the side, you know, eave to eave because they were also acting as Collar ties, or right, whatever. keeping the walls from falling out, falling down. And um, one of the people involved, who was a carpenter who, in in the remodel of this house, um, ran all the new ceiling joists the other way. The other way. Oh, and I was like, mm, it, uh, that's not really a great no, idea. Yeah, so no, when you see that, it's going to be so, fine. So yeah. I, I actually <laughs> went up in the attic, and I mean, this was not a calculated thing or anything, but but kind of turned some of the um, Turned some of the rafters almost like into trusses by doing some some bracing in there. I mean, who knows if I did more damage than good, but it just seemed like... Yeah, there's yeah. a reason the joists usually run eave to eave, not the other way, right? Yeah. So I th- hopefully most people out there know that. But <laughs> Were you seeing any rafters spreading or anything? No, no, I was just a little nervous when I walked in and saw it framed and... Yeah. Well, the, the real issue is going to be when there's a foot of snow on the roof, right? It's yeah, probably right. going to be fine until it's loaded, and then it's going to potentially do weird stuff. Or yeah. your overweight dish installer gets up there. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, on a related note, you know, you look at these old houses, and the, the rafters and the attic joists were all two-by-fours in this little tiny bungalow. And, you know, we think about you know, when you see undersized stuff nowadays and people freak out, but... That thing's been around for a hundred years and it's still standing. So mm-hmm. yeah, I I'm always amazed at the strength and redundancy of wood frame structures. Like old stuff, sometimes you tear apart. You're like, how is this thing up? Yeah, and it does. <laughs> yeah, especially when like the, all these joists are just toenailed into the top plate. They're not even you know, there's no brackets. There's nothing like that. Yeah, some folks say they don't build them like they used to, and often that's good. Mm. So what have you been working on? You still working on your gazebo? Yeah. Well, I don't know if it counts as work when I didn't really get anywhere. There was a lot of trial and error on the reciprocal. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it looks, you're looks putting a lot a reci- more finished than last time. You're putting yeah. a reciprocal roof on, and you, and you need to tell people what that is. It's kind of arranged a like a TP where the, the rafters overlap yeah. each other on mm-hmm. the ends, and it makes it self-supporting, right? Yeah, exactly. It's supposed to be self-supporting. I don't know how long this sort of, like concept has been around that people have been building like wood roofs like this but there's not a lot of good resources out there that i've found like no that makes it easy to or even possible to really calculate what you're trying to do so in that respect it's a little more of a head scratcher so there's just a lot of you mean there's no error. prescriptive tables for uh reciprocal, reciprocal roofs, roofs in not, the irc not, not that i've found <laughs> is that even the official technical term reciprocal roof as far as i know yeah, yeah. that's so, the only uh, term i've seen for we it. put a photo up on the podcast page because some folks are going to be trying to visualize what this it, looks like and it's it's hard to imagine yeah it's kind of yeah. like a pinwheel is what yes. it ends up looking it is like, like that yeah and uh yeah so it was the my future father-in-law and my dad were over. That was the first time they met. It was very... And immediately you put them to work building a roof. <laughs> building a roof that I've never done, that they've never done. Like, I'm being Did told they get I'm along? crazy. Yeah, they got along fine. I think they were both united against me. Like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so this is like so this is like taking your, your, your the, these two future relatives... Um, to like one of those team building yeah. like right, yeah. weekend events. You know? right, it's like a vision ball. quest for <laughs> yeah. dads in law. I, I don't think dads. I would have trusted them to catch me after <laughs> two days of that. But <laughs> So were they both handy? Yeah, yeah. 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 My dad is a retired electrician. He's built for, he still builds furniture all the time. And, uh, you know, he's done a bunch of projects and future father-in-law is a overhead do- door installer and also oh, wow. built his own out. house. And yeah, so he's, yeah. They, they both got experience. Chops. Yeah. yeah. Did they bring tools and stuff? Uh, they brought some, but I have a, everything we needed. Yeah. Usually in doubles or triples. You can just tell how serious someone is about doing a friend's project by what stuff they bring with them, right? Yeah. If they come with a six pack and a bag lunch, <laughs> you know, you have reason to be fearful. Yeah. No, we barely even stopped for breaks. I was like, kept trying to, because it was hot. Everybody's sweating. I'm like, everybody want a drink? No, I'm good. I'm like, really? Really? I want one. Yeah. <laughs> Man. <laughs> They, they didn't want to, like, appear weak yeah. in front of the other one. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, I don't like need any water. A little bit right? of a man off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So yeah. I always wondered what was appealing about cabinet making, right? Because to me, it's kind of fussy and it takes up a lot of room and it's slow and like, well, you get to work inside in the air conditioning. That's what I've decided is is cool about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, less back breaking. Yeah. What do you What have you been doing? So you know, I built that little barn in my backyard. What fifteen Wait, years ago? Wait, we should go ago? back to Matt. We didn't get resolution. Oh, yeah, this. Yeah. So what are you going to do about the? the you got to try again. Yeah, I'm going to try again. With so I got to a point. I. I <laughs> I think I had miscut some stuff is what it comes down to at the end. Um, I had it all sort of mocked up on the ground exactly. You know, everything was laid out exactly the way the plates are on the actual gazebo. Everything seemed to be fitting fine. I didn't account for one thing, cut my rafters, and uh, it didn't fit. I hate when that happens. I was like an inch short of where I should have been, I think. so. <laughs> did, the, did the dads, like, give you endless grief over this? Well, no. The This was day two, so future father-in-law wasn't there. My my father was, and uh, I just told him to go home because it was going to take me a while to figure out what I was going to do next. <laughs> <laughs> so how much material did you cut to the wrong size? Uh, just 10 two-by-sixes. Oh, okay. So it wasn't the end of the world. Yeah. So you yeah. can't just reduce the pitch or something like that? No, to... I, I could, and I, yeah. I tried that, and it, it would have worked fine like that. But the hard part is you're supposed to put the first joist in a little higher than it's supposed to be, and then, you know, you lap every other one on that, and then the last one fits under that first one and over the, the second to last one, and then you kind of lower the whole thing down. Oh, wow. And it weighs you know, hundreds of pounds and I'm alone there with a mm -hmm. ladder and I wasn't really confident that the fasteners that I had in those things would actually continue to hold as I lowered that down and I wasn't going to be able to prevent it from falling to the ground on top of a 10 foot ladder. So <laughs> I, I disassembled it instead like of going forward. Sounds like you need some scaffolding or something. Yeah, yeah, I need a better, a better process than I was using. Yeah. I need to rethink. So... So, I don't even know how to tell you to ask how to do this because yeah. it's it's odd, right? Mm -hmm. And then how do you sheathe it and roof it? What's your plan for that? Um, I was going to use board sheathing uh, originally, but the spans are so big at the bottom, it's going to be like basically eight feet. So then I was going to thinking about filling in with jack rafters, mm -hmm. but you suggested using just two by as sheathing and maybe I'll do that. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Hmm. A lot of lumber yards sell uh, two by six tongue and groove uh, spruce uh for floor and roof sheathing, and that's commonly used in timber frame buildings, mm -hmm. you know, where stuff is four foot on center. And Yeah, uh, yeah like when, you, when you're when downstairs, you, you look up, you see the bottom of the basic exactly. floor sheathing. Exactly. It's meant sheathing. to be exposed on the inside, so it's it's milled and mm -hmm. has V-groove. It sounds expensive. And I bet it is. And heavy, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's going to... And then shingles? Yeah, I was... Well, this is not going to happen probably by the time I needed it to get done, really, but eventually, yeah, cedar shakes probably... So we should tell folks you're building this for your wedding. Well, I was building it mostly to cover up a spot on the lawn that I hate to mow that's covered in roots <laughs> and on a slope. Yeah, that's an easy way to cover up a spot in the yeah. lawn. <laughs> but it, so this was like long part of the plan, but then it became like, yeah, I'm, I'm getting married soon. Let's see if we can get this done and maybe we can use it for that. Yeah, you put the officiant in there and you guys t do your vowels. And, right. Yeah, yeah, cool. So... But it's at least a semi-finished looking structure now because you have the top plates all the way around. So it, it, it almost looks finished. Yeah. It, looks, it could be a pergola instead mm -hmm. of a... a, a yeah. yeah. I mean, we're going to hang a whole bunch of lights from it one way or another. So it, yep. it'll look fancy in the dark. It's going to look awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You got to hang yeah. lights just so people don't fall off the edges yeah. too, right? Yeah. That's the thing. Am I going to... I should probably move on to railings before I finish the roof. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It depends on what kind of wedding you're planning on having. Yeah. Yeah. Some weddings, that would be necessary. Others, yeah. <laughs> eh. oh, What about well. you? So, you know, I was, I was starting to say, I, I've got this barn that I built when I moved into my house. So, I mean, I probably, I was 95% done with it maybe so 15 years ago. So it's not a barn for animals, it's a workshop. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a two-story bank barn. So the downstairs stone walls, like, you know, two stone walls is my uh, metal shop. And upstairs is just sort of a multi-use workshop, wood shop kind of space. That's where you store your... Bicycle parts and outboard no, no, motors no, no. you're I've not using. I've got a whole separate shed just for bicycles, <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, so I, like I said, I was 95% done with it 15 years ago before I had a kid. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I'm finally, you know, I don't use it in the winter because it's just drafty, breezy. I can't heat it. 
And so I'm finally, I'm like, this is the year I'm going to make this place comfortable in the winter. So I had never even finished closing up the eaves. And so birds are nesting up in the loft. And so that was what I worked on this, this weekend. I just took, I had a whole bunch of rough sawn wood and some of those aluminum uh, eave vent channels. You know, they're, they're like the, it's like a C channel with little slits in it, that yep. you, you know, for the eaves. I threw a bunch of that stuff up, you know, really unsafely with like a ladder on top of a flat metal, uh, like a sloped metal roof with, with no blocking. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, you're here. It works. Yeah, yeah. But then the other side I didn't get to because it's like, it's this crazy hillside and I have to borrow some ladder, you know, ladder hooks for planks to get over there because I only have like two spots where I could put ladders. And so there's no way I could even do it my dangerous way that I did the first man the first side so what's the ultimate yeah. goal is to condition the space yeah and that kind of goes back to what we were talking about with that guy's shop uh, last week where yeah he was how far do you take it you right. know because if you're only going to use it a few hours at a time it's not like you're needing it to hold heat you just need to get it up to a comfortable temperature without using tons of you know power or gas or whatever you need a reasonable is. air barrier yeah you just yeah. need it so it's not super drafty so that the the warmth Heat air stays is in escaping there. Yeah. too fast. So, you know, I threw, when I built this thing years ago, it was before I knew much about building science yet. And, you know, I just threw some fiberglass bats in the walls and they're not air sealed and at all. And you have board sheathing, right? No, I do have plywood sheathing. Uh, so it's... You then, have it. A... Yeah. And then the inside walls are also plywood. So when I, I popped the inside walls off, get rid to to kind of get rid of some of the mice that had nested in fiberglass. <laughs> I got some cats. It sounds like you need them. I, I think I do need some cats. Birds, yeah, that'd be great. Mice. <laughs> um, yeah, my dog, my little rat terrier dog doesn't do anything to keep the, them out of there. She's like, I'm not going out there. It's too freaking hot. Yeah, rat terrier, <laughs> not mouse she's, terrier. She's busy chasing squirrels anyway. But, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I'm just trying to decide, like, now that I got the walls open up, do I bother air sealing the sheathing from you the inside? You need the spray foam company to come. yeah. I, yeah, that probably would be the, again. That would be the quick way to do it. Yeah, but uh, a few thousand bucks. Yeah, not in the cards. No, no, not this year. Not <laughs> this year. So, what are you going to do instead? So, I um, in the walls, I've actually got. There were several walls that weren't insulated yet, so I'm going to put rock wool in the walls there. But I want to at least do a m half halfway decent job of air sealing. So you're going to foam around the so uh, foam stud cavities, foam around the the seams. Cool. And uh, close that. Hopefully, get that. So all this isn't going to cost any money. It's just going to take tons of time. Yeah. No. It's. It, I'm trying to strike a balance between keeping it simple and not taking tons of time and not spending a ton of money. So. Uh, so as I recall, perhaps a greater obstacle to keeping this building comfortable are your sliding doors. How are you addressing that? That I haven't really figured out yet. I mean, I might even actually do another set of doors. Interior. Interior, and they might even be temporary doors for the winter. I'm yeah. not really sure. Because um, normally it's just got two big plank swinging barn doors and old, you know, iron strap hinges, which works fine in the summertime, but uh, it's definitely not good in the winter. Right. Well, so. keep us posted on that. I so I can say with some degree of jubilation that my bed is done. That's fantastic. Thank Finally you. sleep back in your house again. <laughs> yes, exactly. So the mattress comes today. But... Uh, I spent all day, or all weekend, actually. I took a half day off Friday and started putting the drawers in the bed and got that done by Friday at 10 o'clock at night. And then Saturday, I made, what did I do? I made the fronts for the drawer boxes and the false fronts for the end. And then yesterday, I painted them, put on the shaker knobs, and then put them on the boxes that are in the bed. And that was it. Cool. Yeah. So we were talking about how setting, you know, when you set drawers with modern bloom drawer slides, there's a there's templates you can use, or a lot of times this, they're sitting right on the box. So there's really not a lot of figuring to do, and they're usually adjustable. But you use the basically the old school side mount uh, drawer slides where you once they're installed, they're they're where they're going to be, right? There's no adjustment. Yeah, so I did uh, a very unconventional approach. I put the slides on the door boxes first, which everyone tells you not to do. And then I extended them when I went to install them. And since they were already on the drawer box, it kept them parallel. And um, all I had to do was figure out how to get them level. 
So what I did is I made a jig with half-inch plywood that slipped under the drawer box and went between the drawer box and the face frame, kept the drawer level, so then all I had to do was extend the slides to the back of the uh, cabinet box and secure them. And I used the slotted screws, uh, tightened them up, took the jig out, closed the door, make sure everything worked, and then opened them up and put the rest of the screws in. Cool. So, so did you actually have the plywood extending way out of the front of the, yes. the box and yes. shimmed it up with some blocking or something? Or? Uh, so I made it, I uh, just put a one by four on the... Um, on edge? Uh, on edge on the yeah. other end, uh, which matched the bottom of the face frame on the bed. Mm -hmm. So it, I had this level platform to put the box on. It kept the slides relatively level and Bob's um, your uncle, as Andy would say. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like we were saying before, luckily you had you had access from the top, which made it a lot easier, right? Sometimes you're installing stuff like this in a kitchen that's already got a countertop or a top on the box. It really proved beneficial uh, to have that ability to do that, right? Yeah. So if you could ever do that without the top being installed, I would tell you to do it. It, it really helped with putting the false fronts on the drawer boxes because I could actually hold them from the outside and uh, use an input. Uh, pack driver to pre-drill and drive screws in the back while I held it in place. I cut little pieces of uh, ram board shims to make the reveals even, and then I could just hold it there yeah. And uh, while I put the screws in from the back side. Yeah, because, uh, you know, you were saying people recommend not putting it on the box first. I mean, if you had a top, a countertop on or a top on the cabinet, you wouldn't even be able to do it the way you, you just did it, right? So what I originally was going to do is I bought this expensive tape that is used by woodworkers uh who do CNC work or whatever, or uh, to hold jigs and templates in place. Like you could put the, this double-sided tape on the back of a router template and, and you wouldn't have any fasteners or anything interfering with your router's travel. Um, but I didn't even use it because I didn't need to. But my thought was I would put that on the drawer box or on the front and then just stick it in place with the correct reveals, pull the drawer out, and fasten it from the back side. Yeah. But I didn't even need the $15 Chinese tape that I bought. <laughs> But I am on their mailing list for other tape products that they think I might be interested in, which is always fascinating. It's written in bad English, which is kind of fun to read. <laughs> Did you find any other tapes you wanted to try? I, I love tape, so I, I'm going to have to try some more. Hostage tape. So after, <laughs> after working for hours, and Carol has been working on her patio for at least as uh, many hours on this weekend, and she's nearly finished, and we talked about how we weren't going to get any more stone, so <laughs> on Saturday morning, she says to me, she's like, I want to go to the stone yard and get some more stone, and I'm like, okay, so she bought 60 more square feet of, uh, these are cut stone, they're, they're rectangular, uh, natural cleft, but it's not quite as artful or difficult to arrange them as it is the natural flags, but... Uh, yeah, she's not giving up. How much does that stuff cost? I'm curious. Uh, so about 400 bucks for 60 square feet, and I think, yeah, that's about what it was. So okay. are, is, is her stone project approaching the cost of your, your barn build from a few years ago? <laughs> no, no, not even close. Um, so this, so I, we've bought four pallets of flags, which they're in round numbers, 450 mm -hmm. uh, per pallet. And then this was like another 400 for the cut stone. And then there's probably been several yards of stone dust and uh, gravel uh, as part of this too. But all told, I bet it's a few thousand bucks. Yeah. yeah. And I think that the price of that stuff really varies widely depending on where you are. Because if you think about it, stone and gravel is basically free. It's the cost of processing and transporting and moving it. it and yeah, yeah, moving it especially. Yeah. Because yeah. like my dad has got this property in upstate New York, which is about a four-hour drive from us. And he's like, oh, there's tons of this great field stone up here if you want to bring it to your walls. I was like, how yeah, the right. heck are we <laughs> on your little Harbor Freight trailer? Are we going to drag that, that stuff your... for four hours on the throughway? Right. Your 280Z? <laughs> yeah. yeah so it's got a big trunk. Yeah. Yep. So after all this work on yesterday, uh, Carol comes out of the shower and she's like, we got no hot water. Well, we, she's like, there's a hot water uh, volume issue. And I'm like, what does that mean? She's like, there's a trickle of hot water. She's like, there's tons of cold. So you may recall in a past podcast recently, I said that my shower valve was installed upside down, so the hot and cold are reversed. So last night at about 8 o'clock, I uh, tore into this and took that out. I first realized that the plumber who put it in didn't center it in the hole he made in the fiberglass shower. 
So the built-in shutoff valves, which are on either sides of the valve body, <laughs> like you couldn't get are to not one. Accessible. Exactly. <laughs> so I had to get my multi-tool out and cut a bigger notch in the fiberglass, and then I could shut it off. And I got to tell you all, I'm sharing this with you because I'm going to save you all a lot of agony if you ever have to do this. Getting the cartridge out of the valve body is very difficult. Moen sells a tool, but you don't need it. Okay. You need a flat bar <laughs> and a piece of three-quarter inch plywood, about six by ten inches, and you put one edge of it on the, the valve body so it's just on there and it would allow the cartridge to slip by. You put the other side on the fiberglass, uh, in my case, shower enclosure, or if you had a tile shower, it would go on that. And then you get the hook end of the flat bar with a little notch, put the screw in the center of the valve cartridge, and you lever that sucker out, and it's popped out. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I tried without the, the plywood on the cartridge body, and it just made the fiberglass flex dangerously, like I was worried I was going to break it. Mm -hmm. But then I moved it over on the just so the edge was just on the shower valve, and it pulled out of there. Oh, satisfying. Oh, my God, it felt so good. Because if you don't get that out, you're done. You have to replace the valve. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll give you one other tip. You know, it's recommended not to put plumbing on outside walls. And you always think, well, in our climate in the nor Northeast, that's so that the pipes don't freeze, especially in an older house. But in one of my neighbor's cases, it was also because, you know, a lot of times a, the the plumbing wall in a bathroom backs up to a closet or just another yeah. wall. Worst case scenario, you're cutting a big hole in the drywall if you need to fix some plumbing. Well, someone enclosed an old porch on one of my neighbor's houses and turned it into a bathroom, and they put the shower valve on one of the exterior walls, and I don't know how that... They must have attached it to the shower before they put it in or something because she's like, oh, the shower valve's leaking. Can you help me fix it? And when I popped off the little cover and realized that there was no way to remove this shower valve <laughs> without stripping shingles from the outside oh of their house. <laughs> so we just kind of made it work the best we could, you know. <laughs> I, I hate doing plumbing, and uh, yeah, I hate it. Interestingly, all the uh, plumbing fixtures in our house have failed about the same time. They're about 10 years old, and they've all started failing at exactly the same time period. It's literally within weeks. I, I find it very interesting, like the design lifespan. Is it mineral deposits that are killing these things? Or I, I don't know. I can tell you that something is gummed up in the shower valve because it's obstructing the hot water flow, right? Sure. So it's either the cartridge, what I pulled out, or if it's not that, it's going to be the pressure balance mechanism, which I don't know how to fix. So I hope it's the cartridge. Yep. Okay, let's get to some questions. Hey everyone, finally writing and regarding to a topic that seems a little confusing. When researching house wrap and weather barriers, I found that a tight house refers to limiting air coming into and out of the house to control the microenvironment inside. How does a WRV prevent, WRB prevent air from coming in and out and still allow water vapor to escape? Doesn't water vapor ride on air to permeate through a barrier? Can you also talk about weather and air barrier assemblies and what situations and environments require what general assemblies and why? For example, hot, humid climates, wet climates, moderate East Coast areas, etc. I know this isn't the most specific question, but just an overview may help. Thanks. Tyler from Williamsburg, Virginia. Well, Tyler. I used to struggle with this, too, when I was in school. And I was in a green building class and talking about, you know, like building airtight houses and having, you know, water vapor going through. And I'm like... Isn't that bigger than the air? Like, if you've got an air barrier, then how is any water getting through there? <laughs> so what's the answer? Uh, well, the air barrier is basically just preventing bulk air, like, you know, air that you would breathe. And it's, it's a different thing. It's a different animal. But exactly how? I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically, you need to be a, a physicist, I think, to answer this question because yeah. it, it comes down to... Pressure differentials and temperature yeah. differentials and mm -hmm. it's permeability, right, is the, yeah. is the real uh, short answer is that house wraps allow water vapor to get through, but theoretically not air. But anyone who studied this will tell you that your WRB, if you're using a conventional house wrap, is not a good air barrier. Yeah. It, your air barrier needs to be something else. The WRB is meant to prevent water from getting in your assemblies, right? So, right. Yeah, like the, you know, you, you have the different control layers in a house. You have heat, you have air, you have water. 
And sometimes a single layer can do all those things, but it takes a very but special material. Yeah, it's it not takes a very wrap. special material, and they've been working for decades now to to figure out the science of all these different synthetic materials so that you get something that that can behave in in a unique way. Uh, you know, different from the older materials that we're that we're used to build. Most older builders are used to building with. The one thing that kind of blows my mind is the whole th- idea that tar paper has a different permeability based on, on the the climate conditions. Yeah, basically. depending on whether it's wet or dry. When yeah. it when it's wet, it's way more permeable than when it's dry, which is exactly the scenario you want. It's like the original mm-hmm. smart vapor retarder. Yeah, yeah. I I want somebody to explain that to me. You know, because I. Again, I think you you basically need to be a physicist to understand how permeability works. But I think we have to just trust these people that are telling us what the perm ratings are of all these materials. Yeah. So I think I think some definitions here are in order, right? So let's let's talk about perm rating. Perm rating tells us the amount of water vapor flowing through one square foot of material. In the U.S., a perm one perm is defined as one grain of water vapor per hour per square foot per inch of mercury. In both cases, the higher the perm rating, the more water vapor can travel through a material. So a grain of water is approximately a drop. There's approximately 7,000 grains of water in a pound of water, and a pound of water in rough measurements is about a pint. It's actually 15.3 ounces of water. So Hmm. (laughs) what does that all mean? It means that the higher your perm rating, the more water vapor the material can pass. And Mm -hmm. as far as I know, the most... Uh, vapor open of all these materials is is Tyvek, which is perhaps why it's been so popular because uh, at 56 perms, it kind of blows away all the other plastic non-perforated house wraps. And that's a distinction that's very important because Tyvek is a non-woven, uh, non-perforated house wrap. And it has, has this great permeability. The other way to get great permeability is a perforated house wrap. And it literally means they prick tiny holes in the in the plastic and it does pretty good at letting vapor out but it also allows water in uh under the right conditions because the holes are too big so Hmm. sure but but, uh, but a good point to make with any wall assembly is that the the key factor you're looking for is that your drying potential is better than your wetting potential so it's not there's not necessarily a problem with most materials building materials getting a little wet it's just a matter of you don't want them to stay wet or get wetter. Right. Yes. And that's a very complicated metric based on uh, the difference between interior temperature and outdoor, outdoor temperature and relative humidity and uh, the assembly itself. The, these are all variables, and it's probably more than we can get into here. But if you really want to dig into the nitty-gritty of WRBs, <laughs> I would only tell you to go to the home building podcast page and look for Brian Pontalillo, the former GBA uh, editor and design editor, who's now um, working at Green Building Advisor, did this exhaustive treatise on WRBs that's in the current issue of Fine Home Building. I think it runs, was it eight pages or 10 pages? I I think it's 10. It's the longest feature we've ever done, I'm sure of it. And it discusses all of these intricacies of these various materials, and it is totally worth a read if you geek out on this kind of stuff. It really, I was, when I opened the the magazine, because I, you know, I don't work on the the print side of the magazine that much, being on the web. When I opened the magazine and saw that article, it really kind of blew my mind. I haven't seen an article that deep in in the magazine. And there are so (laughs) many words. Oh my gosh, it's awesome. Um... So that is totally worth checking out if you want more on this subject, and I think you should. Uh, The next letter comes from Ryan from Vassar, Michigan. I love listening to your podcast and spending hours getting lost on FHB articles. My wife and I purchased a 1950s brick ranch home a few years ago, and we've been doing reno projects from day one. I was hoping the team could help us come up with a wall assembly that will work for our house. We've rebuilt a couple of our exterior walls where we had access to the interior and exterior sides of the wall. These two by four walls were constructed of some type of fiberboard sheathing, see attached photo of our bathroom walls. And the interior has foil-faced paper bat insulation. 
So it's not fiberglass. It's uh, cellulose bats. Have you ever seen these horrible things? No. Oh, my God. So that probably comes from the 50s or maybe or early, earlier even. That's that stuff that kind of gets all thin and dusty over it's time, so right? It's so disgustingly yeah. dusty. Yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. it has a foil facing on it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what it does as far as insulating, but I'm sure it's inadequate by modern standards. Uh, the old insulation barely filled half the stud cavity depth. We did new unfaced bad insulation, sheathing, WRB, and rigid XPS foam insulation on the outside with great attention to air sealing. The new walls come in with an R value of 30. We are now doing a reno in our full bathroom and are trying to figure out an insulation solution for the exterior wall. The old fiberboard sheathing is very air leaky and we'd like to seal up the cavity. It's not very feasible to remove the original brick and old sheathing to install new sheathing and siding. I've reviewed the GBA articles describing how to insulate walls with no sheathing, but I'm not sure if it applies to my situation. I was wondering if I can use 2-inch XPS foam to air seal the cavity and fill the rest of the cavity with rock wool bat insulation. If so, I'd plan to seal the edges with canned spray foam and high-performance tape. I'd like to avoid any solutions that I'm not able to complete on my own, such as spray foam or packed cellulose. I'm concerned about how this approach will perform given we have fiberboard sheathing and then, and then about a three-quarter or one-inch air gap before the brick. Do you have any ideas on how to best air seal the sheathing side of the cavity? We live in Zone 5 but border two counties that are in Zone 6. I heard you guys talking about the Bonfiglioli wall assembly on the July 19th podcast, and I'm hoping to incorporate it into our house to achieve a thermal stud break and increase cavity insulation values. Man. So this is this is a perfect example of one of those wall systems that starts getting complicated and you you, you can kind of go in two different directions and feel like you're arguing for the right so thing to do. The things that I identify and, and I'll let you weigh in on this um, as being potential problems are you have you have a brick cladding which is a reservoir cladding so when that gets wet it holds tons of moisture. Mm-hmm. When that gets heated up by the sun when it stops raining all that moisture wants to go inside to the building, right? It's Mm -hmm. called solar vapor drive, and that's the way it wants to move because it's moving from uh, to the colder, right? Yep. Warmer to colder. Uh, The way uh, heat always moves, right? Warmer to colder is a building science fundamental that you should always think about. That wouldn't be a big deal if you had something other than this fiberboard sheathing, which is super vapor open, right? So that vapor is going to go right through that fiberboard sheathing and condense on the interior of your, or it's going to be the outside face of the wall material, whatever you put on inside is going to be the, where this vapor is going to end up. So that's a problem because mm-hmm. this sheathing is so vapor open. And yeah, and so in in older homes that were built out of solid wood, you know, basically you'd had leaky walls and that vapor drive would drive moisture into the walls and then it would eventually dissipate and before the wood had a chance to start growing mold and and and, rotting. and, and lumber of that era is very forgiving with regard to moisture take up right it, it doesn't start degrading right away yeah but so now in this case with this very vapor open and and very water sensitive material if it's been around for that long and it's still intact you got to wonder is it is it just dealing with that that drying. I think it's dealing with it because it had no insulation sure, <laughs> to, right. to, to speak of. So that's why it could dissipate. Yeah. So, so now the the trouble would be if you just did a fiber fiber insulation, you'd be re- reducing the drying potential of that wall, but still having an open cavity for moisture to move into. So it makes me wonder if if you did foam on the back of that stuff, would it reduce the vapor drive from the wall? Even though it's got a water sensitive material between the insulation and the brick, you know, it has to, you know, heat, hot moves, moves to cold and wet moves to dry. So if you were creating a, a rigid insulation and air barrier, would that stuff still be at risk, you think? I would worry. Yeah. Because we don't know. Yeah. And it depends a lot on climate. And if, if your house is air conditioned, I think it's a bigger risk than if it's not, right? Because you have a, a, a better condensing surface if your house is air conditioned, right, than if it's not. So I, yeah, I th- mean, th- th- this is one of those things that we kind of want to hear from somebody who's actually dealt 
with this wall assembly before, and the safest place to do that is to actually post in the Q&A section on greenbuildingadvisor.com because there are some of the smartest builders and building scientists in there. And I think we need to go check in on that and give a give, unless you've already done that, Patrick. Uh, or, oh, but, oh, that's fine. You can just yeah. assume I didn't do my job. That's fine. <laughs> I won't assume that, but, uh, but you know. This question has been answered, right? Yeah. So, so in essence, I would look at this as insulating a wall cavity for a house without sheathing. I think you have to dis- disqualify this fiberboard sheathing as sheathing. Uh, it's because it doesn't function that way. It's not good at stopping vapor. Uh, and it's not really structural. And it's not structural. I mean, yeah. I have the same stuff on my house, and you could probably poke your finger through it. So basically, it's not really doing much of anything there. It's just sort of sitting there on the outside of the studs. I don't know if it was like the original version of like you know outsulation. You know, with the, I think it was. Yeah, a- and I think it was built that way. I don't know if it functions that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I so what's think, the answer? I think uh, the f- thing that we often tell people is to get thirty. 30- uh, pound felt, uh, fold it into a five-sided shape, staple it along the stud edges and the plates, and that's going to be your your um, uh, vapor diffusion retarder, right? It's going to keep that moisture from coming into the house. It's still going to allow drying to the outside, but it's going to stop or slow that that moisture accumulation greatly. And it's also going to be a better air barrier than your uh, fiberboard sheathing, and so your bad insulation or spray foam or whatever you put in there is going to work pretty well or better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the thing about tar paper is that you've just got to be meticulous and careful with that because it's not going to, it's not the easiest thing to get into the, into an inside of a box. Agreed. And you're going to want 30 pound versus 15 because it's going to hold its shape a lot better when you try and fold it into this origami air barrier. Mm. Plus the pound ratings of felt over the years have actually, you know, just like, a two by four isn't a two by four. The felt is not true 15 and 30 pound felt anymore, I think. It's, so you go with the thick, the heaviest stuff you can get. Yeah, the other stuff is crap. Don't even waste your time. I don't even put that on roofs. Oh, seriously. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. Because, like, say, for example, you have a th- an a- afternoon thunderstorm, right? And you need to pack up your roofing effort for a day, right? If you have 15 pound felt out there, it's going to blow off. It just doesn't have any strength at all. If you put 30 pound felt down with some cap nails, you have a reasonable expectation it's going to be there the next day. I would not expect the same from 15-pound felt stapled down. Mine stayed up on my shed roof. Did it? Yeah. <laughs> but it was, yeah, there were quite a few cap nails in there. And uh, I had also put tarps over part Well, that's what saved you. Yeah. yeah. But then I left it up there too long, and it, it looked like hell. It's terrible. I should have ripped it off before I roofed over it, but it's a shed. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Uh Our next question comes from Spencer from Ontario. I removed a French patio door set from our dining room because it and the wall had rotted due to a leak in the roof. We fixed the leak and reframed the existing opening, which is 80 wide by 83 high. But as it turns out, 80 wide double outswing doors are expensive. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. Um, Patio doors are crazy expensive generally. Around $1,400 Canadian, which I don't think is that expensive. I've I've seen patio doors that are five or $6,000. Yeah, that's like eight cents American. <laughs> oh come on! We, when, when we were at IBS, those gigantic patio doors we saw. There, oh, those are tens yeah. of thousands. Yeah, tens yeah. Of thousands. yeah like seventy thousand. Yeah, so bucks I'm saying like a, an Anderson Frenchwood patio door, door is four or five grand. But still, mm-hmm. when you know you're used to trying to get by with what what you can buy at the local hardware store, oh, yeah. fourteen hundred dollars is a lot of money. Hey, that's a lot of money to me too. I'm just saying, yeah. in, in terms of the cost of patio doors, that's nothing. No. Um, the cheap, cheaper options are still around 1000 and that's got to be vinyl. I, that's the only thing I can ex, uh, explain. And our single 72-inch sliders, which cuts down the opening considerably. So he has a six-foot hole, and you can either put a six-foot sliding patio door in, which means you end up with a three-foot door max, or you put in hinged patio doors, double doors, and you have a six-foot opening. Um, my question is, you ever made your own sliders or French doors for a well-insulated home? Uh, I'm in Ontario, Canada, so the issue would be air sealing them well enough to compete with store-bought. I could get three-foot exterior doors and try to recreate the middle seal that's called an astragal that comes with the big box kits. 
I could also see three 30-inch doors on cider tracks that collapse back to one side, leaving a 60-inch opening. That's crazy. Hmm. Uh, there's no way you're going to seal sliders as good as uh, hinge doors. This no. just never happens. No, I mean, it, it, the, the even if the hardware exists for this triple track arrangement. I've I've been in some architect designed and built homes that they built some really cool mahogany exterior sliding doors, but they were basically storm doors. They yeah. were basically screens. That you can get away with, and even them, they were they were kind of finicky. I mean, trying to get all of the tracks and hardware. Oh yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's, don't go there. No, I'm gonna say don't go there. Uh, I mean, it'd be kind of neat to see someone. I'd like to see someone try. Been, has anyone ever? Do you know if anybody ever has built a sliding door from scratch? No, because it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other details that might or might not be important. This is the best part, right? Yep. I'm a carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's pretty important, yeah. right? Yep. Uh, the roof overhangs 16 inches, and the walls on this side are 2 by 6 with 2 inches of exterior insulation, 3 quarter inch furring, and lap siding. Been listening since episode 1. Keep up the good work. So for a good carpenter, I think this is totally a reasonable project is to make French patio doors. Mm -hmm. And you can buy super awesome European hardware or Japanese hardware if you really want to go off the deep end. You can get adjustable hinges. You can get head and foot bolts. Oh, my God. It could be ah awesome. And you know if, he, if he's if the width of the opening is a limitation, it's maybe making maybe make a fixed panel like a side light. That's what I was thinking. I mean, because yeah. he's talking about a, a very well insulated house and like, like yeah, I'm, but he wants the important. wide door. Yeah, I, but I'm, I guess I under, I need to understand why he needs a wide door because he not wants just a wide like door. A of, no, but I mean, does he glass. want the wide door because he doesn't want to reduce the light in the room, or does he want the wide door because when he's got a party, he wants a seven foot wide opening, you know, or, or eight, eighty inch wide opening, you know? Yeah. Well. I can't answer that for him, but yeah. I would say that having a double set of doors is extremely useful in your house for bringing stuff in and out, oh, yeah. for yeah. partying, whatever, right? For sure. It's just a nice thing. Um, the downside is they are harder to make airtight, right? Yeah. Yeah. When you have two operable units, it's way harder to get a good seal uh, all over the opening. Mm -hmm. So, But you can do it. And uh, the and secret is to have head and foot bolts on the passive panel, right? And that locks it in the opening, and then the other door closes against it, right? And you, you need some kind of astragal, which is attached to the uh, passive door that the active door hits against. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as long as the passive door has some decent weather stripping and bolts and is pretty solidly locked when it's in the locked position, then you're treat the astragal is just treating it like a door jam. So it's, yeah, if you, it's if the you, same if you're, as a, if you're a, a center competent, hinge or a, a single unit. Yeah, if you're a competent carpenter, this sounds like a, a nice project to tackle. And you can buy all that stuff pretty easily now um, as far as sills and hinges. You're going to want uh, adjustable hinges, I would say, especially if, um, yeah, you're going to want adjustable hinges because this is a hard thing to set up. So you want to be able yeah. to tweak it when it's in the opening. I, w I was just going to mention on the commercial side, um, they do, you know, where they have double doors into like commercial buildings, a lot of times they'll have like a removable mullion yeah. in between those. A mull post. Yeah. And so like, you know, the door may seal a little better to that and then you can pull it out when you need that wide opening. Sure. But you could even do it seasonally. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it all depends on whether or not you want double doors for that occasional convenience of moving a sofa in or whether you have, it's an entertaining space and you want to just open it up when you have people hanging out, you know. I think in either case, uh, you could either start with, um, you know, manufactured blanks, you know, full view steel or fiberglass doors, and then set up, set them up yourself. You could also make them out of wood and have insulated glass units made, which would be much more pretty, but uh, harder. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is totally within the realm of a good carpenter to do. If it's like setting up uh, a double interior door setup, except it has weather stripping. But yeah, but I mean, like you were saying, if, if, if he can't get doors big enough, even blanks, to fill the whole space, or if uh, it seems challenging to get an opening that big, you know, aligned and all the hardware in, I, I, I would definitely consider a third panel or a side light. Like, what, a third yeah. panel? No, I'm saying, like, you got two movable panels and a fixed. A fixed. Oh, dig it. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. Make your own. Definitely. Would you start with uh, manufactured door blanks, or would you... Do the whole nine yards. Uh, well, this goes back to what you were talking about, about building your own cabinetry. It kind of depends on what tools and how much space you have. I mean, if you've got a nice, decent two-car garage or workshop, I'd, I'd be willing to tackle uh, 
building my own door from scratch. I mean, I've, I've got, my house is from the 1870s, and you can't find the style of wit door right. that, that went on the front of my house. And the unfortunately, the previous owners put some cheap, ugly steel doors in. And I've been, for years, wanting to, to replace them. And I, my idea is I was thinking of buying a wooden door with an insulated gla- glass panel in it because the, the style that my house was was the kind with the double arched windows on the on the doors. Yes. So I was actually thinking of mi- getting one with just a single fixed insulated panel and then making trim to essentially make it look like uh, it's got two arched windows in it. So, I mean. So in the shops that you've worked at, did you guys ever do your own door construction? Oh, yeah. Did they use dominoes to uh, join the styles and rails? Because I understand that's become the kind of industry standard. Whew. Um, now we were doing some custom stuff, so they had actual either tenons or, yeah. I, th- I think you should buy yourself a domino and <laughs> you can justify it by the fact that you saved a thousand dollars on your patio door because <clears throat> it costs a thousand bucks. Unless he already has a mortiser. Right. Yeah. And that's a better joint anyway, because mm-hmm. the dominoes are kind of small for an exterior door in my opinion, but the, the bigger one, the domino XL apparently, uh, the, Tenons are big enough for door construction, yeah. exterior door construction. Does, it, does everybody out there know what a domino is? It's, should I? Should yeah. we say? Yeah. Go well, ahead. You, mo- you've used it more than me. I've better. never touched it. <laughs> I can't afford that. <laughs> it's a floating tenon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a tenon. It's a mortise maker, right? It's lo- it looks like a biscuit joiner, but instead of having a, a rotary cutter on the end, it's got this drill bit that oscillates back and forth and makes a slot. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yep. That's why it costs a thousand bucks. I would also suggest, if you don't want to make your own, is to every lumber yard has a boneyard of mis- misordered or damaged uh, windows and doors. And I would call around, and I bet you that you're going to find something that's going to work for way less money than it would take to buy a new one. Or uh, I don't know if they have them up where he is, but uh, around here we've got the Habitat Restore. And a lot of that stuff is you scratch and dent or stuff that's pulled out of a demo or a remodel. And uh, you might just luck out and find something you need there. I would also tell you uh, don't buy the $1,200 uh, double unit patio door because <laughs> those are not reliable. Wait till they warp and you'll never get it to seal. It's just like it is something not to, to, to cheap out on for sure. Uh, boy, so we got a question on our uh, YouTube channel. So uh, thanks to Cantankerous Dave, who's weighed in on a couple conversations, but he also had a question that he put up on the YouTube. Mm. Uh, In episode 180, you talked about how the wall sheathing to foundation transition is a difficult area to air seal. How would you go about addressing the problem, uh, this problem transition area? Can anything be done after the fact? It sounds a lot like what I've got going on an extension built off the house I bought. So I have the perfect solution for this. Um, if you're doing a new build, Protecto Wrap Triple Guard Energy Seal Sealer is the way to solve this problem. That's the T-shaped stuff. Yeah, so it's it's Seal Seal is uh, a foam product that goes between the foundation and the mud seal, and it does a couple things. A, it's meant to stop air leakage, and it's also a capillary break between the foundation and the wood components of the house. It stops water movement, and it works okay, but it doesn't do anything to solve the uh, wall mm-hmm. uh, transition, right, from foundation to sheathing. But this product, uh, which has a couple flaps on it, one laps down onto the foundation and one uh, goes up onto the sheathing. I personally think this should be put in the code as a requirement for new construction because this is a notoriously leaky spot and this is an elegant solution that doesn't really screw up the normal construction process. All three of the legs have um, individual release sheets. T- release tape, yeah. so you can uh, build in the right order and not have the uh, stuff sticky. getting stuck on everything. Yeah, stuck on yeah. stuff. So there's and, a, you can there's fluid applied products too that are kind of like made for this. I think Pros- Prosico, I don't Prosuco? know how to say it. Prosuco? Yeah. Whatever it is. Prosecco? They, yeah, they like make it. I think it's Argard. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> Did I say that wrong? <laughs> Prosecco is a liquor. Yeah, it's like, yeah. It's, it's like a wine, like champagne. Kind of yeah. yeah, that's not going to seal sh- st- anything. <laughs> 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 but anyway, yeah, that's like you just sort Brush of gun, on. gun that in. Can you do it after the sheathing is up and the siding? Yeah, you do it after the sheathing. I don't know if you can do it after the siding. 
So, I mean, this particular solution, I don't think will work on a retrofit. On a, no. on a retrofit, it can't do. So, it. Yeah, but but it brings up a good point. You mentioned capillary breaks. You know, we we're talking about dry, wetting and drying potential. I I wonder how many people out there are, are aware of the the risk of capillary action from masonry up to the to the walls because that is it, a nice feature of this mm-hmm. this uh, material is that you are actually preventing anything from wicking up into the framing. If we go from that more to less uh, conversation that we had earlier, once again, w- water is always moving from more to less. So that foundation wall, which is in constant contact with the soil, which is loaded with moisture, is always taking it up and giving it off on the other side of the ba- on the basement, which is why it's so important to have either damp proofing or some kind of uh, capillary break. Uh, on the outside of the foundation wall, like those dimple mat membranes are great or the fiberglass products, whatever. It decouples that moisture source. And the same thing happens. It goes up uh, into the framing of the house going through the top of the foundation wall similarly. So you need to isolate that. Yeah. And and the tough thing is when you're doing a remodel, especially, especially on an older house where there aren't any capillary breaks and you're taking a, uh, an assembly that used to dry pretty well on its own. And whenever you start tightening things up, you got to always worry about, are you making a, a, a dangerous situation in a spot like this? Are you going to increase the vapor, yeah. uh, the humidity inside yeah. the house? Because the tighter, tighter I've made my old house, I've definitely made my basement damper, which means I'm ha- at more risk for my sills. To rotting. Be, to, rotting, yeah. yeah. To answer your question, uh, cantankerous Dave, Boy, there's not an easy way to deal with that uh, in an existing structure except to lie on your back and get some kind of urethane-based construction adhesive and try and squirt it in that gap, which sounds Mm -hmm. detestable, (laughs) especially if your siding is close to grade, right? If you Mm. have a couple feet there, it wouldn't be as bad if it's a few inches. But, yeah, that's that's the only thing you can do. It might be easier to remove um, some of the siding if that's an option to to deal with this transition. Um, Vinyl would be super easy, lap siding less so. Yeah, and it also depends. I mean, brick not going to happen. How much access you have from the inside? I mean, how are you going to fix it from the inside? Well, I'm talking. If we're talking about air sealing here, I know. So we're sealing the sheathing layer to the foundation. How are you going to fix that from the uh, interior? I'm just talking about if you went into your band joist and your sill plates where they meet the foundation, you can definitely cock there. Certainly do some potentially do some stuff there. I don't know if that's going to be uh, as helpful because I think on the exterior air leakage is going to still like travel beyond the bottom plate into the stud cavities and then it could go anywhere sure. right so sure. um you've got to seal that gap i think on the outside uh tapes on, uh would be great but it's going to show you can't do that yeah and do you have any other thoughts no. on that no i just like a gunnable solution <laughs> yeah so like well i mean because this thing I, I think it's an elegant solution but it's there's so much stuff going on at a job site. Like the chances of it getting damaged, I think, are are pretty high. Plus, you have to like you know a lot of people will overhang the sheathing a little bit, you know, past that bottom plate, and I don't I don't know how that's going to work there. I think you're going to have to hang it even lower because you want to cover up that that tape. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what I mean? So you're going to have to hang it down an inch or two. Yeah. Do you think that's a problem? I don't know. But that I don't looks think it is. a little unconventional. Oh, it's unconventional. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when it comes down to it, you know, the dealing with remodels is is a diff, existing conditions. It's a, it's always so much harder. And, oh yeah, and it's really the condition the the specific conditions you find yourself in are going to dictate how how effective the various options are. Uh, it's so much easier to do stuff right the first time, but <laughs> that doesn't always happen. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Matt, Rob, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com, and please like, comment, or review us however you're listening, and it helps other folks find our podcast. Thanks again for listening. Happy building. <laughs>